Welcome to the Common Good Project. This is the second conversation in our series on what is the common good. My name is Ryan Mead, and I am the convener for the conversation series, and I'm joined today by my co-convener, Chris Conway. We will dispense with our introductions and our, our bi biographies so that we can get to our guest scholar. Uh, and we're very pleased to have as our guest scholar today, Professor Jay Budzhevsky, who is also on our advisory board. And uh, uh, Chris will introduce Jay in just a moment, but uh, just to remind everyone on the format of our conversation series is uh, there'll be an introduction and then I will start with a, a question to our guest scholar and then we will have a conversation and uh, then there'll be more questions as we go along. In this conversation, we're going to do it a little bit different in that uh, Jay has prepared two papers for us to reflect on uh, based on the questions that we have discussed with him. And then we will have a formal response by Chris, uh, which Jay will then also respond to. So uh, we hope you enjoy this discussion. So with that, I will turn it over to Chris to introduce our guest scholar. Our guest scholar today is Professor Jay Buzhyshevsky who is a professor in the Departments of Government and Philosophy at the University of Texas at Austin. He also teaches courses at the University of Texas School of Law in jurisprudence that are cross-listed in multiple programs. Jay is a distinguished philosopher focusing in the areas of political philosophy, legal philosophy, ethics, and conscience, and a range of other related themes. He is a prolific author of 15 books with the 16th due out mid-year. He has authored or co-authored dozens of chapters and articles. Many may be familiar with his blog, The Underground Thomist, uh, which combines serious philosophy with an acute sense of whimsy. Currently, he has embarked on an ambitious project of commentaries on Thomas Aquinas's work. These are commentaries in the classical sense of parsing and commenting on unabridged texts in their entirety. In the same way, medieval academics wrote commentaries on Peter Lombard's works, and Aquinas wrote his many volumes of commentaries on Aristotle, and in turn, the scholastics wrote commentaries on Aquinas. He has completed four so far, one commentary on Aquinas's writings on virtue, with particular emphasis on justice, his most recently, re uh, most recently released commentary on Thomas Aquinas's treatise on happiness and the ultimate purpose, and highly relevant for the Common Good Project, his commentary on Thomas Aquinas's treatise on law, as well as his commentary on Thomas Aquinas's treatise on divine law. Professor Bujashevsky received a Bachelor of Arts from the University of South Florida and a Master of Arts from the University of Florida, both in political science. Since receiving his PhD from Yale in 1981, he has taught at the University of Texas at Austin. Jay also, we believe, may hold the distinction among our guest scholars as our only guest who has, who had the fortitude of his convictions as a young college student at the University of Chicago to leave university life for several, several years to become a welder, eventually working in the shipyards of Tampa before returning to his studies. Welcome, Professor Bushyshevsky. And thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so we have started the conversations uh, with a general question of what is the common good? And before I ask you, what is the common good? <laughs> you, you've, you've titled the sub theme, the flavors of the common good. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear your paper today and your comments uh, and what is the common good? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the uh, thanks for organizing this project. I think this conversation series is a great thing, and I've enjoyed what I've uh, what I've heard in it in it so far. Well, according to Thomas Aquinas, every genuine law is an ordinance of reason for the common good, made by public authority and promulgated or made known. Now, any enactment then that lacks any of these qualities, for example, an enactment that uh, isn't directed to the common good, which is our topic, is a sort of a fraud or imposter. It is more like an act of violence than a law. 
I doubt that we really give enough thought to what we mean by the common good. And one reason for this is that the common good comes in different flavors. A good may be shared or it may be common in different ways and to different degrees. And even Thomas, St. Thomas's expressions are sometimes a little ambiguous. Often people call a good common, for example, in the extremely weak sense that it's good for, for everyone. Well, there are lots of things that are good for everyone. For example, wealth is a certain amount of wealth is considered a common good, or perhaps aggregate wealth is called a common good merely because we all do have material needs. Uh, I need a roof over my head. I need clothing on my body. But this is a misleading way to use the term common good because I may get more wealth or whatever the good thing is by taking it away from you. We don't enjoy community in this good, and that's what's essential. Now, for this reason, Thomists, people who uh, are within Thomas Aquinas' tradition, have in mind a stronger way of speaking of common goods. Some other people, including some economists, have been rediscovering some of what I'm about to say, too, although they tend to give it a very different twist. First, a good may be common in the strong sense that it excludes competition. Pie doesn't exclude competition, because if I have a bigger slice, then there's less left for you. Literacy does exclude competition because my becoming more literate doesn't, doesn't make you less. I read better. That doesn't mean that you read uh, more poorly. Second, a good may be common in the still stronger sense that no one is prevented from enjoying it. The comradeship of a healthy family is a common good in this three, third sense, although such as it is, the comradeship of a disordered family that picks on and just torments some of its members certainly isn't one. In itself, a bridge over a river is a common good. Everybody can travel across it in this, third, in this sense, but it wouldn't be a common good if I set up a toll gate and allowed only those who paid the toll to cross. And even though literacy is a common good in this third sense too, well, it wouldn't be if I used force to prevent you from learning how to read. Third and stronger still, a good may be common in the sense that if anyone enjoys it, then no one even could be prevented from enjoying it. National security is a common good in this sense. I can prevent some people from crossing a bridge. I can prevent some people from learning to read. But if invaders are kept out of the country for me, they're also kept out of the country for you. There simply isn't any way to restrict access to a good like that. It just can't be done. Finally, a good may be common in the extremely strong sense that there couldn't even be a rational motive for preventing someone from enjoying it. Because if I don't have it, still I gain from the fact that you have it. Virtue is like that. You might have greater wisdom than I do, greater courage. You might have greater virtue in general. But if so, you didn't get it by taking it from me. And more important, not only does your virtue make you a better person, but if you're more virtuous, then I'm better off just because you are. Now, you may have noticed from these remarks that the question of whether a good is common or not presents uh, paradoxes in all of these senses. For example, wealth doesn't seem to exclude competition, as we saw. But um, really, doesn't that depend on social arrangements? If I can become wealthier only at your expense, well, then certainly it doesn't exclude compet uh, competition. But on the other hand, if there are ways for us to cooperate so that we both become wealthier without making anyone poorer, then perhaps it does. Making the paradox still deeper is that the private and the common in certain ways may be complementary to each other. Common good doesn't necessarily mean collective good. According to Thomas Aquinas, the very reason for the institution of private property is that it serves the common good. Well, what's the, the solution to that paradox? First, each person takes better care of his own property than what belongs to everyone at once. Second, it's easier to pinpoint responsibility if each person is charged with caring for particular things. Third, when goods are divided so that each person has something of his own, there are fewer quarrels. So even though some may have more property or better property, the institution itself, the institution of private property, can make everyone better off than if everything were owned in common. 
since St. Thomas's time, other ways in which private property can contribute to the common good have also been discovered, which we don't have to go into right now. But the point is that the institution of the private ownership of property um, is a common good, even though property per se isn't one. Here's another paradox. We've seen that you and I can't possibly have a, a rational motive for competition over virtue. Yet we can have irrational motives for competition, can't we? For example, I may envy you for being braver than I am. Now, it's true that the greatness of, say, your courage doesn't leave less courage for me. But if I'm an envious person, then I'm not thinking absolutely. I'm thinking relatively. After all, even though the greatness of your courage doesn't make my courage less in absolute terms, it does make it less in relative terms because the more courageous you are, the lower I rank in comparison, especially in the eyes of others, and that may be very important to me. I might therefore wish that we could trade places, that you were less courageous than I am. So you see that although we can't really be in competition for courage per se, we can certainly be in competition for rank regarding courage. And so unexpectedly, something that has no room for rivalry in one sense can actually become a motive for rivalry in another sense. Any good at all may give rise to competition if we bring in the motive of envy. And since even common goods suffer this problem, let's call it the paradox of envy. The paradox of envy even has political repercussions. To see this, um, let's return to an example that I gave before, national security. We saw then, if the country is invaded for anyone, then it's invaded for everyone. So that in that sense, there's no possibility of competition. Yet, although citizens can't be unequally protected from invasion per se, they may be unequally protected from the burdens of preventing it or the burdens that result from it. For example, they may be unequally likely to be drafted into the army or they may be unequally taxed to pay for the war or dwell unequally close to the places where fighting is likely to occur. Concerning things like that, they may very well compete. They may fight with each other to shift the burdens of conscription and taxation um, and dangerous locale onto others. Is there a, a, a solution to the paradox of envy? I don't think there's exactly a solution, but there is a sort of a defense against it. The only defense really is for each person to regard all of the others as as friends, as fellow members of a partnership in a virtuous life, one in which not only can each of us flourish, but also each of us can contribute to the flourishing of the others. And the very prevalence of this attitude and the, and the prevalence of the conditions that make it possible is actually another common good. Now, I, I, I freely acknowledge that this is an ideal. I'm not presently discussing how to get people to believe in the common good or speculating on what's going on in their minds when they deny the possibility of a common good or if they have contempt for it. Um, and I'm not suggesting that agreement to cherish it would solve all of our problems. That's certainly not true. I'm simply trying to explain what the common good is. You don't have to believe in, in, the, uh, in, in the coherency of the ideal uh, before you have to believe in the coherency of the ideal before you can take any steps at all toward the amelioration of our messy reality. But even so, um, notice that the people we sometimes call rational egoists, people who deny in common good, aren't really rational at all. Suppose you counseled a mother uh, that it would be um, foolish to, to, to risk her life by dashing in front of a speeding truck to push her child to safety. Suppose you said that even though the child's death would sadden her, she could always have another one. And besides, if she were crushed to death, then she'd be lost to the possibility of happiness. So, so why should she push the child out of the way? Well, people who say such things have never loved. In the first place, another child is not this child. Loving someone isn't like having a favorite chair that one finds more comfortable than others but could be replaced. In the second place, the death of the mother's child, if it were because of her own failure to act, her own negligence, would be a greater death to her than her own death would be. 
Echoing Aristotle, St. Thomas remarks, since he who loves another looks upon his friend as another self, he counts his friend's hurt as his own, so that he grieves for his friend's hurt as though he were hurt himself. I think that's true. You know, we, we often use expressions like looking out for number one, which means looking out only for myself. But you see, the mother no longer experiences herself as number one. And she's right. To say that we're social beings is in part to say that human experiences is open to love. The good life, this is another paradox, but it's true, is only good for us when we throw in our lot with others who can enjoy it with us. Openness to love is the only satisfying defense against the supposed conflict between private happiness and the common good, I think. It's the only thing that can convert the common good from an abstraction to a, to a lived reality. So whenever individuals bear burdens for the sake of the common good, and let's make no mistake, uh, if, I, I, if I'm giving up something for the community, it is a burden. But whenever they bear burdens for the sake of the common good, they do it for love. And that complicates in what sense it is a burden. Friends take risks for their friends, often gladly. Parents take risks for their families. Doctors, soldiers, policemen take risks for their neighbors and fellow citizens. This doesn't mean that individuals are mere tools of the collectivity, parts of the state, like my finger is a part of my body. Uh, because ultimately, the common good of the community is for the sake of the individuals who make it up. What it does mean is that they view each other as friends. Now, the solution, such as it is, doesn't solve every problem or answer every question. I've admitted that. And uh, it's obviously more effective in personal friendship than in civic friendship. Uh, I think that's pretty clear, too. Civic friendship is a lot more watery, and it's a lot less intense than personal friendship. And, and, and yet, to the degree to which a community of friendship is a compound of a lot of personal friendships, civic friendship is more effective than you might think. Even a soldier, for example, who has doubts about the Roman maxim, it is sweet and fitting to die for your country, may not hesitate to throw himself on a grenade to save his buddies. And even today, despite the glaring disorder of our civic culture, most people would swiftly agree that if an elderly next door neighbor asked for help in changing a light bulb in a ceiling fixture, um, they, would, they, would, they would do it. They wouldn't ask, first tell me how you voted in the last election or demand payment afterward. Okay, I changed your light bulb. That's, uh, that's 10 bucks. And moreover, there are approaches to living together. This has been recognized for centuries that can make the approach that I'm suggesting still more effective. That's why Aristotle said that good legislators, it's a strange statement at first, good legislators give even more attention to friendship among the citizens than they do to justice. In the first place, if the citizens are friends, they're going to want to do each other justice. But there's more to it than that. In the second place, if they are friends, they're going to rise above justice. They're going to do things for each other without keeping score. They won't always be chucking up to make sure that they're getting what's justly coming to them. The most important element of the common good, therefore, is that all of the members of the community regard themselves somehow as friends. This is, I suppose, first of all, true at the local level and each little partnership in the good, like the family, but it's more broadly true at the general level, where the political community is not just another partnership in the good, like a family, but bigger. It's partnership among partnerships in the good. It's a, a compound partnership. Fellowship, uh, fellow citizens need to view themselves as friends concerning the good that is common to this partnership of partnerships. And by taking this view, they, they, they actually bring this good into being. And so when Thomas Aquinas says that a true law has to be for the common good, he's not merely saying that good legislators will take good care of the city water supply or that they'll try to prevent disease, although of course they'll do that too. Sure they will. He means chiefly that by the discipline of the laws, they habituate the citizens to a communion of friendship with each other. As he writes, the principal intention of human law 
is to create friendship between man and man. Well, how might that be done? One example is that although in general property is private, we might try to encourage its owners to be generous in allowing its use by neighbors. Moreover, in small but important ways, the law can encourage that. It can encourage them to take a broad view of just who their neighbors are, too. For example, um, I, I suppose in most discussions of, of the law today, we uh, don't bring the Bible in, drag it in, as some people would say. But Old Testament law did this when it instructed, you shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep go astray and withhold your help from them. You shall take them back to your brother. Or when it directed, when you reap your harvest in your field and have forgotten the sheep in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. Now, obviously, provisions like that wouldn't uh, accomplish the same ends in an industrial society like ours that they would have in the agricultural society for which they were designed. But I think what sorts of provisions might accomplish ends like that in an industrial society like ours is very much worth considering. So, Jay, that, that was really fascinating. And there are a few points that I want to reflect on before we, we move into our second part. Uh, one of the points is the emphasis on friendship and law being about friendship at, at many levels. Uh, this, I just as a personal anecdote, this reminds me of when I first started studying uh, Aquinas and law. Uh, I wrote a, a paper on the definition of law uh, as we were using it in the Common Good Project. And I got the paper back and scribbled on it was simply, you're missing the point. Law is about friendship, which I found rather confusing at first, but that's because I simply had not connected up and read, uh, read deeply enough into it. But it, it, in law being directed to the common good uh, and the common good really only being able to be achieved as an ideal if there is friendship. One thing I, I, want, I want to just circle back around to with that point in mind on friendship and, and private property because it, it might be a little bit challenging for some people to think of private property, the institution of private property being directed to the common good is somehow being connected to friendship. So, so one, I wondered if you could respond a little bit to that. And then secondly, if you can also put this, uh, put this into your thoughts is you mentioned that the institution of private property is for the common good, but private property itself, per se, is not for the common good. D does that mean that things are not for the common good and only acts? Are I, I, I understand. Yeah. 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 Well, well that, I, guess, I guess that precise way of, of putting it on my part may have been a little bit inf infelicitous. What I mean is that, what I mean is that if I have a swimming pool, you may not be enjoying it. <laughs> if I have a remote automobile and I'm not sharing it with you, you may not be enjoying it. But that we're both better off if there is an institution of private property such that you can own some things and I can own some things. Now, I'm also leavening that with the observation this, that, that the, 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 uh, the way we tend to divide things into private property, collective property, is a little bit too simple. Uh, all the way back to Aristotle, we find, the, we find the observation that you might have private property for private use only, you might have common property, or you might have private property where people acknowledge uh, common use. My, my, uh, my neighbor says, my neighbor may, may bang on my door in the middle of the night and say, I can't get my car to start. My, 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 my child is bleeding to, to death. I got, can I, please, can I take your car and, and get her to the emergency room? And I toss him the keys and say, take them. All right, that's private property, but it's, um, but it's for common use. 
And in this case, since it is my automobile, I'm taking better care of it than if it just belonged to everybody. I remember when I was a little boy, uh, my dad and some of the neighbors wanted to keep their lawns nicely mowed, and nice, nicely edged, and they, they all chipped in together to get uh, a grass edger. And nobody took care of it. Everybody took care of his lawnmower. Nobody took care of the edger. And so they, they almost might as well not have gone into it at all. They didn't, you know, they didn't wash it afterward and the mud was on it like concrete. It wasn't cutting properly. Nobody ever changed the blade. It was, um, you know, it was a mess. Uh, this is, so I think that, um, I think that what I have, if I'm selfish about it, may not benefit you at all. But, um, but since the reason why private property is such a good idea is that it's good to have this institution, um, that's, that, that, that uh, is, a, is a solution to that dilemma. It also points out that even the fact that I own some things and you own some things is for the sake of not just me and not just you. It's for the sake of us. One way that some natural law philosophers put this is that um, is that uh, is that common goods um, have a have a universal finality or a universal destiny which is confusing language but it just means that if we're trying to write, work out the rules of private property we shouldn't imagine that it's all about me private property even the fact that I have something that you don't and you have something that I don't is still about us no, no, thank you. Um, so, so with that, let's move on to the second part. So uh, one question we are exploring with many of our guest scholars uh, is what laws, could you give us some examples of concrete laws that are either directed to the common good or not directed to the common good? Yes, I, I can. You had, uh, you had mentioned to me that this was something that you were especially interested in. So I, I, I did give some thought to this. I think some pretty blunt examples of both rules that are directed to the common good and rules that aren't directed to the common good can be found in the recent response to the coronavirus pandemic. Public health is a common good, of course, not, not the only common good, although some people who have been dealing with the, uh, this public health emergency have treated it as though it is. Um, but it is a common good, and some of these decrees are obviously necessary. For example, during a pandemic, of course, people should be directed to keep a certain distance from each other inside public buildings and you know, or in places where the flow of air is limited and not cough on each other and so forth. But other coronavirus dictates are utterly impossible to explain, I think, in terms of the common good. Or at least I don't see how they can be. I can't speak to the situation in England. Um, which is where the Common Good Project is, is, is housed, is centered. But I can certainly speak to the situation in the United States, in my own country. Consider, first of all, decrees that do nothing but punish activities the, um, the rulers don't like. Now, often that includes worship. At one point in San Francisco, California, city authorities restricted attendance and places of worship to one person at a time even in the Cathedral of St. Mary of the Assumption, that holds 3,000 people. They even tried to prevent people from worshiping outdoors. Yet retail stores were permitted to admit up to half their usual capacity. Hair salons and massage parlors were allowed to stay open, even though they're often pretty small and they bring employees and clients into close contact with each other. Later on, even more draconian, uh, but equally inconsistent restrictions on worship were enacted for the entire state of California. By inconsistent, I don't mean that they were inconsistent in their hostility to religion. I mean, they were inconsistent with how they treated other activities. Now, no one would be permitted to enter the cathedral or any other building for worship. And yet Hollywood would still be permitted to have studio gatherings and singing contests and even to serve food at them. Well, okay, let's next consider rules that are devised to, sh to shift burdens uh, not to discriminate among activities, but among persons, to shift burdens among, upon, onto persons whom the rulers disapprove or whom they consider less worthy of life, such as the elderly and the vulnerable. Early in the pandemic, the governor of New York State, Andrew Cuomo, decreed that people with the coronavirus be moved from hospitals to nursing homes. 
causing a surge of infections and deaths among the most vulnerable of all citizens. Later, he defended his policy by saying, well, those old people are going to die, whatever you do. Then come all of the rules made by authorities who don't really think they're necessary at all, but want to make a hypocritical show of concern for the common good, for public health. In November, the mayor of my own city of Austin, Texas, Steve Adler, live streamed a video urging citizens to stay home and to avoid travel. Because as he said, we may have to close things down if we're not careful. Well, he didn't mention in his live stream video that he was streaming it from Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, where he was on vacation. The problem wasn't that he traveled there. I don't blame him for that. The problem was that he did so while telling citizens not to. He obviously didn't think that this was a necessary public health restriction. He just urged it as a, uh, for a show of concern. And finally, I would say never underestimate the sheer satisfaction that some officials take simply in telling people what to do. Telling people what to do. That has, that has very large forms. It also has petty forms. Apparently, no other motive is really needed. When the coronavirus began to spread, the governor of the state of Michigan in my country, Gretchen Whitmer, ordered that although the citizens would still be allowed to kayak and to canoe and to sail, they would be forbidden to use craft like motorboats or jet skis or other, other uh, uh, powered watercraft. The tissue thin rationale was that powered craft need servicing, which involves close contact among people, but that craft like sailboats don't need to be serviced. If you believe that, then I have a bridge to sell you. The moral of these stories, uh, uh, Ryan, is that rulers will always claim that their enactments are for the common good, but such claims have to be carefully examined. It isn't enough that they say they are. They have to be examined. It may be true that you can't fool all of the people all the time, but the tendency of those who hold power is to try to fool as many as possible for as long as they can. All right. Well, thank you uh, for those thoughts on laws that you uh, particularly believe are not directed to the common good. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll hold my uh, comments and reflections on, on, on this part of your discussion uh, till later. For now, I'll turn to Chris, who has uh, prepared a, a formal response. Okay. Uh, first, thank you for your comments, Jay. Uh, they are a lucid discussion of the aspiration of law to provide the conditions for friendship. I'd like to read a quote uh, from your commentary on Aquinas' treatise on law, which my response and questions are built around. Most thinkers today view law as response to sheer conflict. Though St. Thomas is keenly aware of this problem, he views law primarily as a response to the lack of coordination. I would like to start this summary response and questions by focusing on the COVID examples you listed. Um, the examples you cite focus on arbitrariness and inconsistency both of which can be deficiencies in the law, not only because they fail as a command being directed to the common good, but also because they raise questions on whether a law meets Aquinas' first criterion of the character of law, that it be an ordinance of reason. Um, putting the specific examples aside for the moment, but staying within the lessons of the COVID era, it seems the past year has been a teaching moment for both the UK and the United States on making law quickly and challenged us to grapple with whether we have sufficient civic friendship to make our way to political responses to broadly similar goals. So I would like to get at uh, the more general question of how we resolve differences on how to get to the same goal and the common good. Uh, if I could paraphrase your comments partially in my own words, members of society need to remove themselves from a zero sum mentality and instead view each other as friends working to the good common to the partnership of partnerships at the level of the political community. When considering the common good, the mentality of what is good for me is good for me and what is good for you is not good for me is unhelpful and irrational according to Aquinas. Um, citizens need to no longer see themselves as atomized individuals, but as friends in the collective us in order to work towards what 
that which benefits the communal whole but maintains the dignity of individuals. You highlighted instances where the impulse to exclusively look out for number one breaks down and the community arises. For example, within families, amongst friends, and between neighbors. Most meaningful societal relations, relations are not zero sum, and we all benefit by viewing and treating each other as friends, that is, other selves, in these occasions. This strikes me as correct. Uh, but more aspirational than the reality we face. The political process in many polities around the world, including the United States and the United Kingdom, is in fact zero sum as a practical matter. Either a political party or coalition wins power or they do not. Once in power, the political party or coalition either passes a particular law or they do not. The current state of affairs of many political communities, even before COVID, seem to be drowning in power struggles and not friends discerning the prudent approach to get to a goal. Also, there is an increased trend that a person's political ideology and party preference is correlated with other measurable demographic characteristics, such as age, gender, racial and ethnic group, religious affiliation, level of education, level of educational attainment, and particularly in the UK and the US, the population density of where a per person lives. As political tribes divide and stack on top of these growing number of identity characteristics, it is unsurprising that we have also seen a rise in negative partisanship, that people have grown to loathe and fear the opposing party and its candidates. In our current situation, and particularly over the past year with COVID, viewing political adversaries as friends proves more and more difficult. Within our current political systems, there are few incentives for the minority coalition to collaborate with the majority in power, even if a proposed policy is prudent and directed to the common good. In collaborating with the majority's political win, the minority jeopardizes its own chances of regaining power by legitimizing the majority's rule and appearing weak to its increasing tribalistic members, falling further into politics zero-sum game. If the majority is passing good laws and maintains broad support, why would the public hand power back to the minority? One's own political coalition undoubtedly believes they are better suited to be the stewards of the common good and their own policy prescriptions would surely better serve the communal whole. Accordingly, winning and maintaining power becomes the imperative for both the minority and the majority of the moment. If the opposition is not like us, and they do not view or experience the world like we do, or even listen to us, we couldn't possibly trust them to act according to the common good. Even if society can generally agree on overarching principles of what constitutes the common good, like prom promoting virtue, peace, and human flourishing, for example, operationalizing laws directed to the common good without devolving into enmity can prove very difficult. A society may broadly recognize that it wants and needs to get from point A to point B to, to further the common good, that getting to point B would be in their common interest. But there are many paths to get to point B. Each path requires trade-offs, a, balance, a balancing of some group preferences and identities over others in pursuit of the common good. If we are drifting further apart, how can we talk to each other to build broad consensus on the correct path to point B? This, bring, this brings to mind Wittgenstein's well-known observation, if a lion could speak, we could not understand him. We humans could not understand the lion because lions and humans live forms of life that are too radically distinct. Are we falling into tribes and metaphorical species that live forms of life where we cannot understand each other, let alone be friends? In the Thomist ideal, the law is not principally to manage power struggles but to produce better coordination of resources and conditions for flourishing. How do we reconcile this ideal with the fact our zero-sum politics game is the primary mechanism to manage ideological power struggles? How can we remain friends when some of us win power and influence while others of us lose it? How do we avoid becoming unable to speak to each other because our forms of life may have grown too different? Okay, 
Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate your, your uh, observations and uh, you ask good questions. Um, the first thing, now I'm going to come back to this, but I want to set it on the table first, is that it's not precisely my view that, that we should look upon everybody else as a friend. Rather, we should look upon each other as potential friends. We should aspire to that. It doesn't involve uh, uh, pretending that something that is not the case is the case. Um, it strikes me that you may suspect that because I stress the aspiration to civic friendship, though, I must have a rosier view of political matters than you do. And in all respects but one, actually, my view is probably a good deal more dire than yours. For example, I certainly agree with you that laws shouldn't be made in haste. Uh, you commented about that as one of the problems in the response to the coronavirus uh, uh, epidemic. But I don't think the problem with the examples that I cited arose from making laws in haste. And I don't think that um, those enactments and policies were merely uh, ill thought. I think they were made in bad faith. For example, in consistent considered hostility to religious worship while under the guise of concern for public health. Um, there are some things that can happen accidentally because you're in a hurry, but there are some things that really just don't. Moreover, there's an increasing tendency not only to do whatever it takes to attain office, but to try to block the very expression of views with which one disagrees. You commented on the fact that people may not listen to each other, but they may even try to, try to shut each other up. Increasingly, parties and factions refuse to recognize the principle that one must not do what is intrinsically evil, even for the sake of a good result. Well, that may seem like a pretty big point, but it's actually, I think, in one way, a, a little point because um, a bigger and more important one, I would say, is that those who reflect on politics should view political disor disorder the way that doctors view bodily disease, even if perfect health will never be achieved. Still, in order to recognize disease, to understand what it is, to work out how to ameliorate it, what's gone wrong with the bodily system when, in, when, when disease is the condition, well, one has to know what health is. And in the same way, even if the civic friendship will never be fully achieved, even if we're very far from it at the present time, still in order to recognize civic enmity and discern what to do about it, one has to know what civic friendship is and recognize that it's good to aspire to it. Some legal scholars use the term realism for ignoring all moral considerations, as I'm sure you know, as though it were somehow more realistic to ignore part of the reality. Uh, the part of the reality that I have in mind is that humans are moral beings, even when they're behaving wickedly. A vicious or an untrustworthy man is not the same sort of thing as, a, as a, say, an untamed dog or an untrustworthy wolf who is not even capable of uh, vices and virtues. I, I also agree with you, Chris, about tribalism being on the rise, but I'd like to consider some of the causes of that trend, at least as, as I see them. The chief reason for the increase in tribalism isn't that there have been injustices to some groups in the past, as a lot of people today would have it, but rather that our political and intellectual classes are increasingly skeptical of any difference between the just and the unjust. They don't think that that distinction is really there in, um, in, in, in the nature of things. They think that words like just and unjust are merely disguises for selfish group interests, that what I want I call just, what you want I call unjust, uh, no matter what it is. And the reason for tribalism isn't that people live so differently today. People have always lived differently. But one of the reasons we see such wide divergences today, even more than usual in some respects, is that fewer people even believe any longer in a shared human nature or believe that a good way to live can be discerned by reasoning. Now, if I don't believe in objective truth about these kinds of things, um, if I think there can only be objective truth about uh, you know, whether 2 plus 2 equals 4 or some other number or, or whether lead has a higher or a lower boiling point than uh, melting point than gold, um, then my opinion about things isn't even an opinion about things any longer, not in the proper sense of the term, because after all, an opinion is an opinion about what is true. And the very thing that I'm denying in that case is that there can be a truth, an objective truth about matters of justice or injustice. What we, if we're in that situation, then what we might still anachronistically call believing in 
X, Y, or Z becomes merely a personal characteristic or an identity, like the color of my hair. So if we think this way, of course we have tribes. How could we not? Now, there is, these are some ways in which my view might, as I said, might be even more dire than yours, but there is one way in which I take a broader view than you do. I believe in the natural law. You mentioned Ludwig Wittgenstein's remark, if a lion could speak, we could not understand him, which is a, a really nice line. And you ask whether fall, we're falling into tribes and metaphorical species that live forms of life that are so different that they're literally incapable of communicating with each other. Kinds of being so far apart that they're like uh, mollusks and, and, and reptiles that, uh, or better yet, uh, uh, mammals and, and, uh, and mammals, mollusks, so that they're literally incapable, even in principle, of ever becoming friends. Wittgenstein, of course, was coining a paradox. He was speaking paradoxically on purpose. I think he was dramatizing the fact that a rational being cannot enter into the mind of a beast just because the rational being is rational and the beast is not rational. And that's true. We, with the kinds of minds we have, we can't imagine what it is like to be driven uh, by instincts in that manner and not even to be capable of a universal concept. But in, of course, in order to speak speak, if a lion could speak, Wittgenstein said, in order to speak, a lion would have to become a rational creature. And then it would not be a beast, it would be a potential comrade. I think all rational beings are capable of aspiring to agreement in the truth, and therefore capable of aspiring to friendship. If there are rational Martians, I think we, they will, we, will, we will be capable of communicating with them too. If they reproduce by budding, or by laying eggs, their family life may be different than ours. But even so, they will know the golden rule because it's not an instinct of the mammalian nature, but it's a first principle of the rational nature. Now, of course, you know, any person, whether he's um, human or Martian or Leonine, uh, may refuse the possibilities of communication and friendship. He may choose to be an enemy instead of a friend. In that case, I shouldn't delude myself into thinking that he is my friend, but I should love my enemy. To think that our enemies have exited the very species of rational human animals would not be greater realism. I think it would be less realism. I think it would be an invitation to a different ism, barbarism. During the last 150 years, certain countries and certain nihilist ideologies really have opened that door to hell and I would like us not to imitate them. Uh, finally, I guess I'd like to say something about the constitutional ramifications of these developments. You asked how we get from A to B, and we can talk some more about that because that's, that's really complicated. I hardly know how to start about that. It would, could, we could take another couple of hours uh, on that by itself. But uh, it's interesting that countries come up with constitutions partly in order to facilitate the process of coming from A, of, of, uh, of getting from A to B in order to keep the government from doing bad things and to keep people from, from viewing each other as complete enemies. Uh, James Madison and the other framers of my own polity proposed relying not so much on written prohibitions, which they mocked as parchment barriers, uh, as on checks and balances. We were to rest our hopes for the common good not on getting along, although, although even they, didn't think that you could, you could achieve the common good if there was no virtue among the citizenry. But we were to rest our hopes for the common good, not just on getting along and being so sweet, but on fighting fair, for a check is kind of a weapon. Um, and it discourage, and it's a kind of a weapon which if used wisely and within the rules, discourages the use of other kinds of weapons so that enmity doesn't become greater. But the idea of a balance based on fighting fair is uh, raises a profound question, which the supporters of the new constitution never answered, or even so far as I knew addressed. The permissible checks and balances are themselves spelled out in written rules, at least in my polity. So if written rules are nothing but parchment barriers, then why shouldn't we pronounce the same damning verdict upon the rules that spell out the permissible checks and balances? What's to prevent a political player from going outside the rules completely, fighting dirty instead of fair, instead of fair competing by unconstitutional means? The only possible answer, I think, is that the framers must have thought that they had drawn up such good rules 
that each political player would find it in his interest to keep playing by them. And the problem is that this is not always the case. And this is, I think, what you were dramatizing in some of your own remarks from time to time. We're in one now. Situations arise in which some players think that they have less to lose by playing outside the rules than by playing inside them. And this, with this, when this happens, we have a constitutional crisis. If the crisis goes on for too long, the side that first began playing dirty may become more and more desperate, partly because it persuades itself victory is almost within our grasp, and partly because the consequences of losing now would be unthinkable. Consequently, it throws caution to the winds, violating the rules ever more gravely and openly. And the more it does so, of course, the more frantic and furious the other side may become, so that it begins to wonder whether it ought to play dirty too. Once it reaches that conclusion, both sides become unhinged, losing even what was left of their principles. And you might have the polity come crashing down. There is no friendship in anarchy. So among other things, cherishing the common good, I think, um, requires believing that there is such a thing as a common good, believing that there are such things as objective goods and evils, and believing that the human moral intellect can get a grip on those things. But doing all this, I also think, requires a kind of conversion. We have to repent that we ever said in our hearts, let us do evil so that good will result. We must resolve never to do that again, and we have to begin again to believe all of the things that have to believe, be believed in order for such a resolution to make sense. I, I do just have one question before I turn it over to Ryan. Uh, if, if there yeah. are some people that don't believe in the objective truth, uh, which we might agree here that is that might be irrational, if there is one person who does believe in truth and another person who doesn't believe in objective truth, how can those two people understand each other? Or those two groups? Well, it's not a matter of understanding each other. They often, they often understand each other perfectly well, but they're going to fight anyway. Um, some surveys of how well conservatives can, can describe the views of liberals and how well liberals can describe the views of conservatives, um, or as liberals in my country come to be called now progressives, um, I have shown that, that a certain degree of ability to understand what the other side is saying is present on both sides. Actually, it's asymmetrical. Uh, the research suggests that conservatives understand what liberals and progressives are getting at better than progressives understand what conservatives are getting at. But there's some understanding of this on both sides. The, the problem isn't that they can't understand each other. It's that they may come to a point where they don't care. They aren't willing to engage in a discussion of the kinds of things that would have to be considered to decide who is right, because they've already made up their minds. And um, now, if somebody is determined not to be your friend, not even to aspire to friendship, to be your enemy, how do you treat him? Well, you know, states enter into situations like this with other states. There are such things as war. Um, within a state, there are such things as, 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 as criminals. Whom you, can also, whom you can only put into prison. I'm not suggesting putting our political opponents into prison. That's one of the things that destroys the possibility of civic friendship. But, um, but I do think that we can borrow one lesson from just war theory. Just war theory distinguishes between just and unjust wars. One, there, is, there, is, there are some principles that have to do with when it's allowable to go to war, when it doesn't just count as murder. And there are some principles as to how you fight it. As to that second set, how you fight it, one of the principles is that you must never use such tactics that completely foreclose the possibility of ever reaching a rightly ordered peace with the enemy. That's even if you're, you have a real enemy, I think that that's a, an extremely important restriction to follow. Along those lines, Jay, uh, you had mentioned that we don't need to treat everyone as a friend but as a potential friend. Uh, in, in the example that you just gave, which I think is very interesting, borrowing from just war theory and keeping that open, uh, it, it, it strikes me that the reason we need to keep that open is because we do need to think of others as friends. Maybe we haven't achieved friendship or maybe it's very difficult, but we must think of everyone as another self. So the 
a person as a potential friend, uh, is that uh, the, the capacity for friendship or is it, it do you mean more the, the directional? I see. Acts, yeah, yeah, that's a, uh, it, yeah. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good question, and it it it, uh, it makes me realize that there's one respect in which my phrasing could be could be uh, tightened up a little bit more. Let's distinguish between what has some what between the the ordinary civic community and what has sometimes been called the community of nature. Just in so far as we are human beings, there is a certain common good that we share with each other, even if you are my enemy. Okay, that's a kind of a friendship. But on the other hand, mm -hmm. at uh, at um, at the at the daily operating level, you know, if you're throwing bricks through my windows or something, we certainly can't say that I'm a friend. At, and in in that sense, even though I may I may aspire to us to us becoming friends. Fair fair enough, um, and uh, good distinctions. Uh, I think along those lines, also going back to your point about bad faith, uh, and particularly yeah. in the decisions uh, related to the COVID uh, restrictions on, on worship, uh, mm. where um, I believe it's a fair uh, summary that, that you, you ascribe some bad faith to those decisions in California. Uh, is it possible that perhaps it wasn't bad faith, but the, 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 the political authorities simply have lost track of understanding other people, particularly the people who value worship, value participation in liturgical mm -hmm. uh, ceremonies, and that uh, in the heat of the moment, uh, though there are a lot of moments, <laughs> uh, to be sure, I'll concede that, that they, they simply didn't appreciate uh, the, sure. these folks. Yeah, I, well, I think that's part of it. Uh, this, let me explain why I why I call it bad faith rather than just misunderstanding. But then let me talk about the element of misunderstanding that is is present mm -hmm. there. I call it bad faith because they're pretending that this is about public health and it's not. It's about enmity to religion. But it is entirely possible that one of the reasons for their enmity to to religious faith is that they think that religious faith is. Um, is a bad thing, that they think that it's contrary to the common good, that they think that it's a delusion, that they think that um, we're just, uh, you know, we're just animals, there's no God, and, and, uh, and we, we, shouldn't, uh, we, we shouldn't do that. We'll, of course, I disagree. What we will do in that case is end up worshiping other gods than God. We'll worship wealth, or we'll worship power, or we'll worship the state, or we'll worship something. We'll worship sex, we'll worship ourselves, we'll worship our reputations. Um, but there's, there's no escaping worshiping something. I disagree with them. I disagree, but but um, but even if they thought, even if that's what they thought, good faith would involve saying, would you, just just being upfront and saying, I think religion is a bad thing. You know, there are some people who do say that. I think religion is a bad thing. I think we should stamp it out. But it's bad faith. It's a lie to pretend that you're doing something for the common good when it's really motivated by your hatred of religion. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think you're-, you're right. Excuse me, to, to pretend that you're doing it for public health when it's really motivated by your hatred of religion. Yeah, and, and, and I, think, I think this last point is important because uh, if we are with Thomas and Aristotle, uh, people only choose what they believe is good. They might be wrong, very wrong, um, but- yes. But but it, it it is an apparent good. Uh, so so, you know, if if one were to uh, give someone the benefit of the doubt, which it strikes me that uh, in a mode of trying to be friends, that is is what we should do. Uh, it uh, I, I I just wonder about the role of animus, and how strong the bad faith might be, uh, versus as as you say uh, that that yeah. they, they they may not believe that this is a this is good. But are for whatever reason afraid to say it uh, in in that respect. Well, it's pretty hard to understand how we can how we can aspire to civic friendship at all if we don't even have a commitment to truth with each other. Mm -hmm. One of the conditions of friendship is that you communicate. One of the aspects of an aspiration to friendship is aspiration to agreement in the truth. You know, so you can't you can't you it is lying to each other is not a uh, is not a conceivable way of of uh, of reaching of reaching uh, honest agreement in the truth now I, I i realize 
uh, Ryan, that that uh, behind your you're being very gentle, but behind your 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 question, I think might be a concern as to whether um, my own readiness to say that some of these guys are lying and acting in bad faith is itself something inimical to the the aspiration to to uh, to friendship. And um, I think that I would say you shouldn't be too quick to to make that judgment. And I and I don't make this judgment quick. I, I tried for a long time <laughs> to try to see these things otherwise. But um, but uh, I, I don't. OK, it has been said that the meek will inherit the earth. And I believe that. But I don't think that being meek is the same as being um, gullible. And I think that uh, there's another saying that ha that's connected with this, be as innocent as doves, but as wise as serpents. And uh, when people are acting like serpents toward you, you don't want to let go of that innocence of doves, but you want to, uh, you want to be wise enough to, to discern what they're actually doing to you. So I'm perfectly willing to believe that a guy may have an honest belief that religious faith and worship are bad things. Okay, sure, we can talk about that. But, but if he... If, if he um, if he claims that his regulations are are morally neutral and that they're all just about public health and and uh, the the risk of of contracting a disease is much greater it, when you're when you're w one person in a three thousand person cathedral than it is in a little massage parlor, that's just so absurd. It beggars belief. Now you are right about about something else too, and it actually is one of my favorite uh, uh, quotes from Thomas Aquinas. He says that. Um, it is, it, he says, it is impossible to will anything except under the aspect of the good. Nobody wills evil for its own sake. And that's not what I mean by bad faith. Nobody wills evil for its own sake. Even when people are willing evil, they're willing it because they're, they're convincing themselves that it's good. Um, now, I don't think that that lets us off the hook. And we've, we've all done that. Every time any one of us uh, commits wrong, that this is what's going on. We've all done this, but it doesn't let us off the hook. People sometimes say, well, you know, he acted with good intentions. But the intention of everybody who ever does evil, including the three of us here, is a, a good intention in that sense. It's just not a good intention in a good enough sense. And so I say, let's start with honesty. If you want to stamp out religion, just tell me you want to stamp, you want to stamp out religion. Tell me that. Tell me that. And don't use the uh, don't use the the uh, preventing the spread of disease as a cover for doing something altogether different. Yeah. I'd rather be I'd rather have I'd rather have honest enmity enmity if somebody is going to insist on being my en my enemy than uh, cloaked enmity. Right, and and I, I, and I will love my enemy <laughs> as yourself. <laughs> right. um, uh, yeah. Right. Uh, so I, I and I and I I think you've said something very, very important there, and that is honesty. And, and th this is at least, now I, I'm probably going off, off uh, topic a little bit from the flavors of the common good, but in some of the discussions that we are anticipating having, and, and uh, it, certainly in the literature that we'll be reading in the common good project, uh, for those listening in, it, it, there are questions about whether words like neutrality uh, that the liberal state, and, and I use that in the, the, the classical liberal uh, sense uh, in the enlightenment form of, of a liberal state, that, the, that those words are hollow and that it, people hide behind them, they sound good, and that it would really be best if people were honest uh, and that the political authorities were honest as to what they believe so that we can strip this hollowness away uh, or fill it in and start to mm -hmm. debate and discuss the first things uh, because this uh, some of what you've described and what you've identified it, it 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 hits me that it requires debates about first things in society which perhaps in societies and ages past were assumed but we can't assume that there's agreement on on certain basic of fundamentals these days. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I actually agree. I've, um, I'm on on record. I've written many pages uh, arguing the this very thing that 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 neutrality is a um, 
neutrality is um, is a hollow idea. That when one claims I'm being neutral between between different conceptions of the good, it only serves as a cloak for smuggling in one conception of the good without having to make an honest argument for it. Mm -hmm. Now, a person may not realize that that's what he's doing. I don't necessarily think that everybody who's used the term neutrality is is arguing in bad faith. Although some certainly have been arguing in bad faith, but it always is a delusion. Um, for example, suppose we said. Oh, there's disagreement about, about marriage and whether it ought to be polygamous or monogamous. So let's be neutral between polygamy and monogamy and have our law be open to both. That is, in fact, a polygamous law. <laughs> mm -hmm. That is, you know, um, uh, under, under a polygamous regime, that doesn't mean that every man has to have more than one wife, but it means you may have polygamy. Abortion is like this. Let's, as people say, oh, I'm not pro-abortion, I'm pro-choice. I, I, I'm neutral between whether it should be done or whether it shouldn't be done. But, you're not, but, if, but, but if you enact a law legalizing it, you're not neutral on the question of whether this counts as uh, an illicit private use of lethal violence against innocent persons. You're, you're, saying, it's, you're well, saying it's illicit. Yeah, and, and along those lines, I think there's a question I think and maybe we, we, we sort of could wrap this all up into questions of where to draw lines. Because, uh, and I'd like to throw out your uh, prudence as a question, uh, as something for, for you to reflect on in lawmaking, in directing it to the common good. Because uh, it, uh, it certainly, uh, Thomas is not saying that every vice uh, needs to be uh, outlawed. Uh, and... Uh, and also in trying to coordinate resources, uh, such as during COVID and an emergency situation, there are there are were many factors in play, uh, such as what industries to keep open, as you've described, uh, for uh, for certain economies to and and where there might be a concentration of workers. Uh, and to keep those open so that people had jobs and and money that would uh, come in to help their family for because they couldn't work from home. So so, mm -hmm. so I, I suppose where I'm going with all this is that law sure. needs to be directed to the common good. Um, I think, as Chris mentioned, many paths uh, to go from A to B. Uh, prudential decisions need to be made, but also in the heat of the moment of, of an emergency, uh, there need to be decisions. And now, I, sure. I, I certainly agree with some of your points that it don't need to be uh, hard, hard, to, hard to square them with reason on, on this craft versus that craft, you know, and so forth. But uh, where does prudence come in, 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 in directing a law to the common good, choosing that path, both in yeah. emergencies and non-emergencies? Yeah, it's more difficult in emergencies. You're under you're under a pressure of time. You're under you're under emotional pressure. Uh, people get excited. It's harder to think clearly. Uh, there's the people speak of the fog of war. Well, there's also the fog of panic, and uh, this makes prudence more difficult. The interesting thing is, I mentioned the natural law earlier. I believe in the natural law. People have a, have the wrong idea about the natural law tradition. They think they have this this picture of the na of the natural law in their mind, where a natural law philosopher says, "Here are these principles, and I can deduce like a mathematician from these general principles everything to do in every situation." No, natural law philosophers acknowledge that that within the envelope of the of the uh, basic principles, the fundamentals of good and evil, um, uh, decisions still have to be made, and almost everything concerning the details of those decisions is to be decided not by sheer deduction, but by, uh, but by, uh, by, uh, by, by prudence. Th Thomas Aquinas distinguishes between what he calls uh, conclusio, which means you've got a principle like, like don't, don't uh, deliberately take innocent human life, and um, now, because of that, it follow, and you've got another principle that says, and what is, and and fundamental wrongs must be punished. And so, from because of that, you say we're going to punish murder. Okay, that's conclusion from premises. It's a straight inference, uh, and that should be the same in every country. But on the other hand, you've got questions like, well, how do we punish murder? Do we put people in jail for life? Can we ever let them out? 
can you ever be sure that somebody is now safe? Uh, how, when has he paid his debt to society? Um, um, could you have some something other than imprisonment? What about capital punishment? Is that is that proportional to the gravity of the deed? There's all kinds of decisions like this that have to be made, and some of these decisions um, have to be made in the light of circumstances. A punishment uh, that, for a crime that might be quite adequate in one society might uh, might be um, might incite further crimes in another society. Look at the difficulty that Western societies have had in getting rid of dueling. You know, you try to stamp it out and you and you just suppress it and you might just have more dueling and it's even more dangerous because now it's now it's done secretly. Um, decisions about things that are not criminal matters, but uh, but purely civil matters. How shall we allocate resources between this and that? Um, these are these are things to be decided by prudence. They can't just be uh, they can't be what what is more adequate to the common good here let's put it this way there is no instrument on which we can weigh all of our considerations and the little needle on the scale says um 0 0.6 0 0.5 let's this is the thing to do we can't program it on a computer the only instrument there is for for determining what is prudent in the circumstances is the human moral intellect itself and in order for it to work well we have to talk with each other. Well, I think that is a a good place to end, uh, since we're um, I think we're past the past the hour, and we appreciate you staying out a little bit longer. Uh, I think we could continue to have this conversation, and and uh, and, and and as you said, um, um, talk for several more hours. But uh, that last point is important. Uh, continue to talk to each other having conversations and dialogue, which is exactly what we are hoping to have with this series. So thank you, Jay. Fascinating discussion and thoughts. Enjoyed it.